Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Wild Neighbors Speaker Series. This series is a collaboration with Travis County Natural Resources, who co-manages the Balcones Canyon Lands Preserve with us, and a number of other private and public partners also co-manage the BCP as well. Before we get started, I want to quickly introduce myself. I'm Jaya Torres with the City of Austin's Wildland Conservation Division. Today, we're lucky to have Texas Nature Tracker's biologist, Craig Hensley. Craig is one of two next Texas Nature Trackers biologists with the Community Stewardship and Engagement Program with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Spanning 40 years, Craig is a lifelong naturalist and educator, having served as interpretive naturalist from Minnesota and Nebraska to Texas. He served more than eight years as interpreter and resource specialist with Guadalupe River State Park and Honey Creek State Natural Area as a wildlife biologist and has been in his current role for the past three years. Craig's presentation will explore the vital roles and diversity of pollinators and native wildflowers that you can plant to attract them. After the presentation, Jeremy Hall with Travis County will manage the Q&A session, so feel free to put any and all questions in the Q&A box, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can after the presentation. There's also going to be a recording of the webinar posted on Travis County and Austin Wildland Division Facebook and our YouTube channel as well. So on that note, I'm going to stop sharing and I will hand it over to Craig. All righty. Let me do that. Where's my sharing here? Hang on. The wrong button. Let's see here. There it is. Share screen. All right. It says you all can see my screen, so I'm going to trust that you can. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to uh, visit with you this afternoon. Uh, I think this is my second presentation with, with this and uh, uh, happy to be back uh, this time talking about pollinators and native plants. We've got a lot to cover, uh, uh, so I'm going to jump right into it. And uh, as, as was said by Jaya, that uh, we are part of the uh, Community and Stewardship um, uh, Community Stewardship and Engagement Program with Texas Parks and Wildlife. Uh, there are two of us. We actually try to engage people in community science or citizen science. Uh, we use the tool of iNaturalist to engage folks across the state of Texas. Um, and I've, I've always told people that uh, not only is, a, is it a great way for us to collect data on the state's flora and fauna using iNaturalist and having the public use iNaturalist, um, it's also a great way for you to actually learn about what's around you, whether it's in your backyard, the local park, or some national park or state park, uh, wherever you go, iNaturalist is a great, um, basically a encyclopedia uh, in your phone that you can use to learn about the natural world. So I encourage everybody, if you haven't uh, uh, downloaded that and set up an account to do so. So that's a little, just very briefly about what we do. Uh, I want to get right into this and, and start talking about um, uh, pollen, pollination and pollinators. Uh, so we're going to we're going to look at the process of pollination a little bit. We're going to look at the different kinds of pollinators, and then we're going to look at some of the plants that um, pollinators are especially attracted to, at least in my experience. And I should tell you, I live down in the burning area, so I'm in the hill country, just like y'all are. Or you're on on the edge of the hill country there where you live. Um, so I tried to make sure I selected plants that are already native on the landscape, uh, and hopefully I've done a, a good job of covering that for your area as well. Uh, but first of all, uh, the latest number, and it changes, uh, seems to change all the time, but basically 90% of flowering plants require an animal pollinator. And if we look at our global food crops, um, nearly 90 uh, different kinds of those require animal pollinators. Um, a third of those species provide humans food. So um, it's pollination obviously is critical to life, not only for what's going on outside your window, but for our lives as well. And to the point where approximately one in three bites of food or drink require a pollinator. And of course, pollinators do other things besides pollinate uh, flowers. They also feed birds and other wildlife as part of the food chain. Um, Bees as a group are a keystone species, and that's where we we're going to focus a lot of our attention is on those bees. Uh, losses of those, when, it, when I say a keystone species, I'm talking about an animal that if you took it out, things would be greatly disrupted and, and, and 
obviously just based on the first three lines there, if we, we lose our bees, we lose a lot. Um, so basically, I like to say if we have a healthier, healthy pollinator populations, we have healthy ecosystems. And of course, this all, all ultimately relates to habitat. In order for the birds and mammals and all the other critters um, we, to thrive and survive, we need to have pollination services, which means we have to have those small things. Uh, it is, in fact, the small things that make the world tick, uh, as it were. So. In North America, uh, there are approximately 4,000 species of native bees. Um, I wanna point out that the honeybee, which is what most people are familiar with, is not one of them. Uh, they are not native to North America. Uh, pollination as a process began to arise, scientists think about 140 million years ago. Beetles were very much, uh, 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 there's evidence that beetles were probably the first pollinators. And then eventually, a few million years later, um, wasps apparently began eating pollen. And then that those wasps became bees over time, over evolutionary time. Uh, so bees evolved to be the wings of plants. Um, native bees are in decline globally uh, today due to a lot of different things uh, that affect other wildlife, from habitat loss and fragmentation to invasive species, pesticides, parasites, disease, and of course, uh, the ever-present climate change. So before we get into all the different pollinators, I wanted to kind of distinguish between honeybees and native bees, uh, because there is a big difference there. And honeybees, are they're perennial, which means they live 12 months out of the year in large colonies. They spend their winters in a hive, actually living off of the honey uh, that they have stored uh, during the previous growing seasons. They're very much generalists in terms of feeding. They will feed on a lot of a broad range of, of uh, uh, flowers. Uh, females have a barbed stinger, which means that uh, once it stings you one time, it's dead uh, because when it, when it pulls away from you, that stinger sticks in your skin. There's a little muscle attached that pumps the venom into you, but that, that bee goes off and dies. And they also are long distance flyers by comparison to other bees, uh, anywhere from four and a half to five miles generally. In terms of native bees, most are solitary and are ground nesting. Uh, they do not defend colonies like the honeybee does. They have very short lived uh, flying season. So their life cycle in the course of a year may be close to a year or nine months, 11 months um, in terms of when they're active as a cat or as a larva or in the pupil stage. But as adults, they typically, for the most part, there's always exceptions, but there's usually, they're only flying around for a month to two months. They do not, with rare exception, um, store honey. They have a smooth stinger, which means they, because they're not defending, and they're not giving their life for the colony, if you will, they can sting repeatedly as, as many of us have, have discovered over the years, especially with wasps. Uh, many are specialists on a few native species of wildflowers or plants. Uh, they are much more uh, efficient pollinators than honeybees in terms of the amount of, of uh, pollination they can conduct because they're, more, they're better adapted to the climates that they live in and have always lived in. So they will actually start foraging earlier in the day and, and can last later in the day before it gets too cool for them. Um, and, and their foraging habits are a little bit uh, smaller than um, honeybees. Bumblebees might forage up to three miles uh, away from their, their home. Solitary bees more like 0.6 miles and many very, very much less to the point that if you have a yard and you can put in some native plants, you're gonna have a few bees that are gonna take advantage of that because they're there. They're just searching for what they can find. And a lot of them don't really fly all that far. So even a local little garden of native plants in your yard can make a difference for certain bee species. So uh, real quickly, the process of pollination. First of all, pollination is the movement or transfer of pollen from the anther of one flower to the stigma of another uh, within the same species most of the time. Uh, the goal of pollination, of course, is not just the process of pollination, but the production of new seeds for maintaining the species going forward. There are a couple of different basic kinds of pollination. There is biotic or animal pollination. That's where the pollen is actually physically moved uh, 
from one plant to another. And that goes, that's carpenter bees, bumblebees, leaf cutting bees. Those are just three uh, of many, many examples. There's also abiotic pollination. That means wind, water, gravity. That depends on moving pollen without the aid of another organism. The classic example where we all live, of course, is ash juniper in the springtime. And, and sorry to bring up any bad memories uh, with that photograph. The next thing I want to show you, I want to show you this uh, particular um, short video. What we have here is this is in the springtime. This is a queen bumblebee that's just emerged from overwintering. She's already been mated. She's ready to start her colony, her small colony that she's going to make. She's one of those exceptions. She has a very small colony underground usually. Um, the flower that she is on is a plant called marble seed or false Romwell. It has a whitish flower with green tip. You'll notice there's a little uh, line sticking out of the flower. That's the exerted pistil, uh, the female part of the flower. And what I want you to watch on this particular flower, when we talk about biotic and abiotic pollination, this is an example of where we see a plant taking advantage of both. So I'm gonna just play this video. And let's just watch it here. Let's see if I can get it to play the way it's supposed to. There we go. So what I want you to watch for, first of all, I'm very close to this bee and it's not bothering me. I'm not bothering it. So most of the time when bees are foraging, they're not interested in you. So you, you, the, the fear that some people have with them um, is, um, is uh, probably a little bit overblown unless you're really allergic to them, of course. But what's going on as I move closer here, that's just me moving through the brush. What you're gonna start to see is that this bee has to stick its her head inside that flower and to get to the nectar, which is at the very bottom. She's got a long tongue so she can reach all the way into that flower. I don't know if you just saw that, but there were some little flecks almost look like gold that just flew through the air. And so as she's in there, the, the, the listen to her buzzing there, that tells you how close we are. What I want you to notice now is you're gonna to start to see pollen flying through the air here. It's not only landing on her belly, her abdomen, she's actually, some of it's coming out of the flower. The wind is taking there, see, see there it was right there. The wind is taking it away. There goes some more right there. And what it's happening with those pistols on the outside of the flower, not only is that pistol bumping up against her abdomen that's full of pollen, the other pistols that are out there on those other plants may be able to pick up some pollen as it drifts by, as it falls out of those flowers, all caused by this particular bee. So this is a great example of both pollination by wind and pollination by animal uh, that is as a, as a result of um, a bee and a plant that's learned to take advantage of that over time. So I find that kind of cool. I love that little video. So pollinator job description, key responsibility, move pollen safely from stamens to pistols, knowledge, skills, and abilities. I work for the state. We always have to have our KSAs. They have to have good botanical identification skills. They have to communicate to their conspecifics, their, their sisters primarily, where plants are found. They visit flowers when they're shedding pollen. They visit flowers, of, they have to visit flowers of the same species when the pistils are receptive to that pollen. They have to return periodically, annually, and when not possible, provide for offspring that can assume the role. They must be uh, physically capable of multiple long flights. Hairiness is ideal to help facilitate picking up and dispersing pollen, and they must live in the same community that plants are found. So there's lots of things that you need to have to be a good pollinator. And of course, the reward for pollination is that they get nectar, which is a very sugary solution, oftentimes can be 50% sugar versus a soda, which is, I think, 10% or something like that. So very sugary um, uh, liquid that they can get, which is most of the energy they use for flight. Um, they gather pollen, of course, pollens, especially for bees, they contain proteins and carbohydrate, carbohydrates, lipids, vitamins, and minerals. So food for lots and lots of babies. Some plants provide oils that certain pollinators need or require. And then of course the petals and other tissue are for new, also for eating for some uh, pollinators, uh, depending on the species, and then also for nesting material. The one downside, of being a pollinator on a flower is that it's going to attract predators. As you can see in this photograph, this little crab spider just waiting for a small 
predator to land there to make a meal of it. So we're gonna talk about different flowers and how they present themselves uh, real quickly. Uh, composites, which are the sun, members of the sunflower family, are ideal for pollinators because on that one head, there are lots and lots and lots of flowers. So all of these things here on the left, each one of those is a flower. So if you're a pollinator, you can visit many, many flowers in one visit, save some energy, gather a lot of material. And the, and the flowers can be, when we talk about composites, they can either can be composed of what are known as disc flowers, which is what we have here on the left, or they can be ray flowers only, skeleton weed here. Um, and then over here, the more typical sunflower where you have ray flowers on the outside that kind of draw the insect in, and then the disc flowers, which are the fertile flowers typically. And just to kind of show you a close-up of that, here's a ray flower. Most ray florets or ray flowers are actually sterile or only female. Uh, the, the disc flowers, the little tiny skinny ones, those are the ones that produce the seeds. And that's why when you have a dandelion flower, you have lots of seeds because there are lots of uh, florets. Um, and, and each one of those produces its own seed. So when we talk about attracting uh, pollinators, uh, a lot of insects see an ultraviolet light, maybe all of them do. Um, and as a result, what they see compared to what we see, what we see is on the left there, the black-eyed Susan, what they see is in the middle, that ultraviolet light, and that helps them draw them to where the source of potential food is, i.e. the nectar and the pollen. Other flowers use color in the center of the flower. Uh, we have Alamo vine right here that shows the, the reddish center to our eyes. We've got the yellowish center here to the blue-eyed grass. And then of course we have the Texas blue bonnet, which is all over the hill country blooming right now, as you all know. Notice that there are two different colors to the center of the flower. The white right here is a flower that is still receptive for being uh, pollinated. The ones that turn purple generally means that they have already been pollinated and aren't providing nectar. Um, I always, I never really believed that. So I sat down in a patch of blue bonnets one time and watched and I never saw a bumblebee land on a, one of these flowers or a honeybee that had purple in the center of the flower, only the ones that had white. So out there in the natural world, the plants and the animals are actually communicating in ways that a lot of times we have no idea about. There are also flowers that like to expose their stamens easily along with the pistils. These are three examples right here. You can see that the stamens and the pistils are exerted. So when an insect, or like, for example, we take columbine here in the, in the center, a hummingbird has to go all the way up to the, this little thing to find the, the uh, nectar. So it's gonna fly up under there. Its body is gonna brush against the stamens here. The pistil is in the center of that. It's gonna move to the next flower. It's gonna spread that pollen around. Same thing that we have here with Ocotillo and over here with uh, the scarlet globe flower that you find farther west, those two species. And then we have flowers that have nectar guides, which are little lines on the petals. Those are thought to actually direct the insect into the flower to find the nectar and pollen. And then others, um, and all of these are kind of the same way, have what are called landing pads, where they have a pad right here. The insect can land on the pad, as you see here on this, this uh, tropical sage on the left. And then when they land there, the, their weight pushing down on this, the stamens and the pistils are actually above their back and they actually fall down or they press down onto the back of the insect and that's how they can get pollen uh, on their back to spread to the next flower. And you can see from this penstemon right here how these stamens are actually curled around so they can actually dab the insect as it goes into the flower. And then we have some flowers that require buzz pollination. And these are the stamens, they look like little tiny bananas and they have pores on the ends of them generally. And an insect like this really can't do much for it, but a bumblebee can go in here and, and as it gets in here, it makes another high pitched buzzing sound. It shakes its body violently. And as a result of that, that shakes the pollen out and that's how they collect pollen. So for example, the tomatoes that we eat, um, those are mostly now pollinated by bumblebees in greenhouses out in the West. Um, so you can thank a bumblebee every time you take a bite of a tomato these days. So who are pollinators? It's quite a, a, a wide variety, but it's beetles, flies, moths, butterflies, birds, ants, mammals, and even reptiles, believe it or not. 
Um, the largest to the smallest represents the most species of, uh, are represented by the beetles, the least number by reptiles overall. So the insect pollinators boil down to bees, wasps, flies, beetles, butterflies, and moths. Some are better than others. So if we start with the beetles real quickly, about 350 species are currently known globally. Um, you can actually take all of the birds and the mammals and the reptiles and amphibians and the fish, add them all together, and there's still more different kinds of beetles. And some scientists think there may be as many as a million beetles out there that just have not yet to be, that have yet to be discovered. There are about 30,000 known species in the United States. Again, geologically, they're among the earliest insect pollinators of flowering plants. Uh, some of the beetles that visit flowers, and these are all beetles in here, you can see here soldier, be soldier beetles, longhorn beetles, flower beetles, um, uh, and a lot of them that visit have hairy bottoms. They have hairs on the abdomen, which helps trap that pollen and move it from one flower to the, to the next. Flies, a lot of people think of flies as flying around in your house and you swat them or flying around animal droppings or something that's dead. Uh, but they have, we have lots of bee flies, surfid flies, tachnid flies, um, and others that are actually pollinating. Uh, yesterday, the other day in my garden, I was actually taking a picture of that fly right there feeding on wild garlic. Um, and if you like chocolate, you can thank flies because they're the ones that uh, actually uh, pollinate the cacao tree um, that produces that chocolate that everybody or lots of people love anyway. Flowers oftentimes are, that are specific to flies uh, smell very, very bad, like carrion, dead animal. Um, and that attracts the fly specifically. And of course, they do perform other services besides um, pollination. And of course, many, as I'm going to show you in examples here, many are bee and wasp mim mimics in the flowers. So here are the bee flies. Flies, by the way, only have two wings instead of four. But you can see these little guys look a little bit like bees. And that's to, probably to help them uh, not be attacked by would-be predators. Here's some more examples. These are actually soldier flies of different kinds. And then we have the surfid or the hoverflies. And again, here's one that looks like a wasp or a, or a yellow jacket. Here are some others that look like bees. So a lot of variety. And again, a lot of mimicry going on there. So then of course, bees are our most important pollinators. They're basically hairy wasps. There's a great diversity of, in size from the bumblebee down to bees that you can barely see that may be only two or three millimeters long. As I mentioned earlier, they are more efficient pollinators than honeybees. Uh, they create honeybees, by the way, some scientists now are worried that honeybees are actually detrimental to our native bees because they, cr they create competitive issues and maybe taking uh, unfair, I, I don't want to say unfair, that sounds like they're humans, but they take a, a larger percentage of the resources that our native bees need um, and that can harm the population of our native bees. Uh, again, most are solitary and individual bees may visit thousands of flowers during uh, their lifetimes. They come in all different sizes. These are the sm tiny, tiny little bees. This, these, by the way, are goldenrod flowers. If you're familiar with those, that bee is full grown inside one little flower. Here's, of course, a, a, um, a purple cone flower and a small one of those green, quote, unquote, sweat bees. And then here's a little helictidae. This is a frostweed flower. And I showed you how small those um, disc flowers are. You can see how small that bee is. Here are some of our medium-sized bees. Um, we have some bees, we think of bees as carrying pollen on their legs, like you see here with the uh, eucinery and the, col uh, the coletidae. But the megachile actually carry, their, they have hairs on the bottom of their abdomen, and that's where they store and carry their pollen that they gather. Now, just to kind of show you what how different bees collect, this guy over here is a mason bee on the left. And you'll notice he's taking his back legs and he's just shoveling the tops of those flowers where the pollen is to get that pollen underneath its abdomen. That's how it's collecting. And then we have another leaf cutter bee over here to the right doing the same thing. This one's actually not collecting a lot of pollen. It might be incidental right now, but notice how its head's going deep into the flower. That means it's going in and drinking nectar in that particular situation. And then if we look at these two guys, these are tiny, tiny bees. So a thistle flower on the right 
and the frost weed on the on the left and just watch and you can see that, that little guy on the left has its pollen on its foot and it just goes around to the top of the flower and pulls the pollen off and then if we watch the lazier glossum over there on the right again it crawls to the top of it's so tiny that it goes to the top of one of these individual flowers and there are hundreds of these flowers on one thistle head and you can see how they just strip the pollen right off the top of each of those flowers and then of course we have the big, big bumblebees we have the uh, the sonora and the american honeybee are probably the same species but right now they're separated depending on who you talk to and then we have the shiny honeybees those are the carpenter bees and they get very large as well they have a they have no hair generally on their abdomen that's why i referred to it as a shiny hiney and then of course we have wasps wasps aren't generally thought of as pollinators but they visit the adults visit flowers all the time they are predatory in that they kill prey to uh, by paralyzing them to put in the nests for their babies or for their for the eggs the eggs hatch and feed on those those um, uh, paralyzed prey items uh, but the wasps the adults themselves are nectar feeders for the most part and there are lots of different examples i'll go through these very quickly you'll notice their names uh, digger wasp this is a wasp that digs a hole i watched one digging actually pulling rock out of the ground from underneath the ground to make its den uh, here's one that eats grasshoppers here's one that eats stink bugs here's one that uh, kills and eats cicadas uh, as larvae um, here's these are mason wasps these make use mud or sand to make their little tiny uh, nests um, uh, as they for their for their offspring and then you have big ones like this tarantula hawk wasp and then over here on the left there's actually a honey mexican honey wasp that makes a paper hive uh, that's actually pretty impressive it looks a lot like a bald-faced hornet um, nest if you've ever seen those and then we have these other guys these guys are um, feeding actually crawl underneath the ground those white grubs you find under the soil these guys are eating them so they're good to have around um, the more pesticides you put on your yard the more damage you do to things like this so i know you want to get rid of those grubs but let nature take care of it and they do a pretty darn good job of it and then we have the little thread wasted wasps and they eat all kinds of caterpillars and moths um, so they are very important predators as well and then of course we have butterflies and moths um, there are actually 10 times more moths than there are butterflies globally um, they're more incidental pollinators in that they're not their primary source or thing that they're doing at a flower is drinking nectar. Moths, because they're a little hairier, will generally provide a little bit more pollination. But here are just a few examples of some of the butterflies you can see in our area. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't met an ugly butterfly yet, uh, but you can see a lot. And if you notice on, when they're on the flower, their bodies aren't pushing up against the, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, stamens. So the only place they're going to get some pollen is and a large part might be on their, their toes, literally, or their proboscis. And then, of course, hummingbirds. There have been 19 species that I know of documented in Texas. Our most common are the black chin, which are summer residents, and the ruby throats, which are migrants through our area. And, of course, that long bill and tongue help get into flowers. They don't just feed on uh, hummingbird feeders or, or red flowers. They feed on all kinds of things. And their pollen, is, as this photo shows, the pollen gets accumulated on the bill and the forehead as they move around the flowers. And, of course, bats are also pollinators. In our state, there's only two that are specialized uh, 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 nectar feeders. And then because of their hairiness, they're spreading around a lot of pollen. But recently, researchers found that another bat in West Texas, the pallid bat, uh, was feeding on the pollen and the flowers of lechugia. Uh, so that's a third, although it also eats a lot of different kinds of insects, um, can eat centipedes, can eat supposedly, can eat scorpions, um, but that's kind of more limited to specific plants out in West Texas. And then ants really aren't pollinators so much as they move seeds around, they scarify the seeds to get them to germinate, so that helps germination, and they move a lot of soil so that they can the plants have a place to grow. And then lizards, they're really limited to oceanic islands. They carry pollen on their snouts when, they're, when they are 
feeding on the pollen and nectar and perhaps the insects that are in there as well. So let's shift to pollinating plants, the plants that are great. And I say great from my standpoint of, of just being out in nature a lot and observing. The first one I want to talk about is agarita. A lot of people don't like this bush because the deer don't eat it and it grows up in a lot of different places that have been overgrazed by deer or livestock. Uh, but it produces these beautiful yellow flowers in February and early March. And because they're so early in the season, lots and lots of different kinds of pollinators will visit these very beautiful smelling flowers. And of course they produce these red berries in May and June that are incredibly edible. Um, I've actually planted this in my front yard in, in Bernie and, and uh, this year I'm gonna have a wonderful crop of uh, berries because of the pollinators. Mexican plum is a tree that, uh, that uh, kind of a medium sized tree that grows in the hill country and produces prodigious amounts of flowers in the spring. Uh, February into early March, um, and uh, the flowers are so fragrant, it's, they ought to bottle this stuff for perfume, I swear. Um, uh, and just to kind of show you, this is one sample of about a 30-minute stay at one um, uh, Mexican plum tree a couple of years ago in late February, early March. I think it was early March. But these are all, these are just some of the species that were visiting those flowers. So as an early spring pollinating plant, Mexican plum is great, plus it's a beautiful tree. And then we have Texas redbud, um, which is a, a lovely little tree that produces these bright pink flowers that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. They are actually, that tree is a host plant for this butterfly known as the Henry Zelfin. Uh, in this part of Texas, you would buy the Texas red bud that has the thick leaves. If you were in East Texas, you'd buy the uh, canadensis that has the thin leaves. The, the, the thin leaf plants aren't going to survive out here in the heat very well. And then another pink flowered shrub is the Mexican buckeye. Produces lots of flowers, lots of pollinators like. And again, the Henry Zelfin is also a host. Uh, is the, it, it is the host plant for the Henry Zelfin butterfly. And then another tree that gets overlooked a lot because it's kind of a smallish tree. The bark is beautiful, um, and, but a lot of people, again, deer don't eat on it like uh, they do everything else. So a lot of it is on the landscape. Um, they have very tiny flowers. You can see here's a monarch butterfly feeding on, the, on one flower right there. That's as big as they are. There are male trees and female trees, but lots of pollinators. They, the flowers actually smell delicious. Um, and lots of pollinators use these tiny little flowers to get nectar, um, but they have to move pollen from the male trees to the female trees. So both of them smell wonderful. And another shrub that uh, grows in more wetland or wet situations, even though I've got two in my backyard and it's certainly not a marsh, is button bush. Uh, these produce a lot of flower heads right here and lots of pollinators will visit them as well. So it's a wonderful uh, plant. Uh, blooms later in the summer, so June to September uh, is a great time to have this one flowering for the pollinators. And then the final one I'll talk about in terms of woody plants is the shrubby bone set. And um, I grow this in my greenhouse at home. Uh, if you need one, I've got a thousand of them, um, literally. Um, I'm just kind of kidding. Uh, but they're a shrub to about six or seven feet tall. They produce prodigious amounts of flowers in, in September, October, into November. And when they begin to bloom, everything moves to the, these flowers. And they, they host everybody on it. It's just, if I had to recommend one shrub in a, in a, in a yard in our part of the state that would attract the most pollinators, it would absolutely be shrubby bone set really amazing plant. So let's talk about wildflowers for a few minutes. Um, I'm showing you a few of the early spring ones. And the reason I'm doing that, because a lot of times these come up in our yards. So these windflowers will go right in your front yard in your grass. And a lot of people go, oh, these weeds, and they want to spray them or they want to mow them down. These are the flowers, these and crow poison and a couple others I'll show you. Without them early in the spring, our pollinators don't have a lot to go on. So these native plants that grow up in our yards or grow along our field edges, things like that, become critical to pollinators in the early spring. And so I always want to show these because they're not big and showy. You know, they're not, you don't have to put them in gallon pots or anything like that. They're only six to eight inches tall, um, but they're so critical. And I think they're beautiful flowers on the, in their own right. 
And yesterday I happened to be out on a trail and I ran into a small colony of crow poison and I stood there literally for 10 minutes, only 10 minutes. And I put it on our Facebook page, our TNT Facebook page, 13 species of butterflies in 10 minutes were visiting crow poison and nectaring on them. And I found one, happened to find one bee that was gathering pollen. So again, flowers like this should not be overlooked. They come up anyway, take advantage of them, let the pollinators have them and let them do their thing. Another one is wild garlic. This is another small one, looks a lot like crow poison, but the leaves actually smell like garlic or like onion. You can actually dig the bulbs and eat them. Um, and they again produce a lot of uh, uh, nectar for pollen or for butterflies like this um, this white and then also this old monarch was actually feeding on that as well another small one that grows along the ground kind of spreads out as a mat is frog fruit uh, it when it begins blooming in uh, may it lasts all the way through fall it only gets a few inches tall but all of the small butterflies and, and pollinators will visit these tiny little flowers that butterfly known as the Fayon Crescent is uh, host or lays its eggs on this plant. Uh, and it's a great ground cover and it's very drought hardy uh, and it's native. So I would suggest that that's one you want to encourage if you have it. Then we'll start going to the more traditional kind of tallish plants. Pincushion daisy is an early bloomer. This is related to um, Mexican hat or um, firewheel. Uh, but it doesn't have pet, it doesn't have ray flowers. It's only the disc flowers and lots of things uh, will, will visit this uh, flower head. Uh, by the way, if you put your nose in that flower head when there's no insects in there, the, uh, the fragrance will just about knock you off your feet. Very, very fragrant, uh, uh, wonderful wildflower. Leaves look a lot like dandelions, so give them a chance. And one of my favorite spring flowers is blooming right now in my front yard and along our roadsides called Texas Prairie Parsley. It has very tiny flowers. You can see lots of heads, but very, very tiny flowers. But the small, the tiny little bees are all feeding on here, gathering nectar, gathering pollen. Took this picture literally two days ago on, from my front yard um, of this particular bee right here. So they're all over this flower. And again, it's not one that is spectacular and has giant flowers, but in terms of importance for pollinators and fairly easy to grow, you can't beat Texas prairie parsley in the springtime. And also just now blooming is our scarlet or hill country penstemon. Uh, this is more, this is not as common as some of our other penstemons, but brilliant pinkish, purple, reddish flowers, depending on the individual plant. It's great for hummingbirds, for sphinx mosses or humming or, uh, moths or hummingbird moths. Great, very beautiful attraction to uh, a native plant. And of course, there's different kinds of milkweed, depending on where you are in the state and where we are. Uh, green milkweed, antelope horn, one I didn't put in here, and butterfly milkweed all do a great job. They're a host plant, of course, for the monarch. Also the queen butterfly, which is our common orange and black butterfly in the summertime. And, uh, and of course the flowers are used by all kinds of pollinators to gather uh, nectar and, and pollen. And then we have the different kinds of cone flowers. We have two in our area. Purple cone flower is a common plant planted or grown and sold in greenhouses and box stores and everywhere else. And then our native one, more native one, is pale purple cone flower, taller, a little bit thinner petals, a little bit paler. But again, both of them are very attractive to our uh, pollinators. And then, of course, blanket flower, I mentioned Gallardia there for the pincushion daisy and black eyed Susan. Uh, both of them, uh, black eyed Susan around here is a little bit more of a um, annual, but um, uh, it also can serve, it's also a biennial depending on where you live. And um, uh, blanket flower is an annual that self seeds readily. And then I'm going to throw this thistle in here. This is a native thistle. And I, I throw this in here because a lot of times we hear the word thistle and we go, cut it down, spray it, whatever you got to do. There certainly are a lot of thistles that are non native, that are very invasive, and we want to, we want to eliminate. However, I will say those things are also super, super um, um, palatable to a lot of our pollinators. But the Texas thistle is actually native to this part of Texas. 
Uh, it does not spread like it does, uh, like the other uh, bull thistle and some of the other non-native thistles. And it attracts all kinds of pollinators, as you can see here. So if you have it, if you have a property and you've got some coming up in the field and you can identify that it's the smaller Texas thistle, let it bloom. It will benefit those pollinators. And we have a couple of other lavender flowers. You notice a lot of our flowers are either lavender or they're yellow. Uh, prairie verbena grows throughout the summertime. It's a low growing plant, popular with a lot of different kinds of, of uh, pollinators, uh, a lot, especially butterflies. And then basket flower is an annual, very tall annual, about three feet or so, um, sometimes taller than that. Produces all of these, these, um, these beautiful flowers um, and uh, is visited by uh, typically a lot of larger insects, although here is a, a little um, uh, juniper hair streak visiting the uh, one of these flowers there, but a lot of times they get uh, the swallowtails really love them and the bumblebees. A couple more lavender flowers, stiff blazing star, one of our common blazing stars in our area. It only gets about two and a half feet tall. It usually blooms, starts blooming late July and uh, September. It is a perennial from a bulb, underground bulb. And then horse mint or lemon bee balm is an annual. It will self-seed readily as leaves smell wonderful when you, when you uh, crush them and it produces these beautiful lavender flowers and they can be deep lavender or a little bit paler. And then we have mealy blue sage of all of these flowers that I've been showing you. If I had to choose only one of these um, um, herbaceous plants to plant in my garden, it would be mealy blue sage. It flowers from now all the way through fall. It, um, is, uh, it spreads some, but it's not, it didn't go crazy but everybody loves that, that little bluish uh, flower, bluish purple flower. So I, that to me is a must for any kind of native plant garden. And then of course, a lot of people have heard of Greg's Blue Mist. I'm actually highlighting here uh, the Blue Mist flower. This is our native Blue Mist flower. Um, the Greg's Blue Mist is more of a West Texas thing, even though it does grow very well here and lots of people plant it uh, because it's wonderful for queens and monarchs in particular. A couple of red flowers. We shouldn't ignore red flowers for butterflies and other pollinators. Uh, standing cypress is a biennial plant. Gets very tall, beautiful flowers. Hummingbirds love it. And then tropical sage. This one is starting. Uh, this will start blooming in. In uh, it can start in February, but usually uh, late March, early April, and it will bloom all the way through the season. It's a perennial. It does really well. It self seeds pretty well, and it's a dramatically beautiful flower to have in a in a, in a native garden setting. And a couple of other plants that I don't know that I'd planted in my garden, even though I did uh, some days. Hey, there's a monarch right outside my window, uh, migrating monarch. Uh, snow on the mountain, you're gonna see this out there on the roadside ditches. A lot of people would cut it down, but here's the thing, when it's August and it's hot, this sometimes is the only flower that's blooming. And um, it, again, I wouldn't plant it in my garden, but if I've got it on the property, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Unless you're a beekeeper, I guess it turns bee, uh, uh, nectar bitter. So that might be a, a caveat. And then we have different kinds of asters, lots of different kinds of asters. One that I grow in my garden is called Texas aster. It has kind of a, um, a uh, arrow shaped leaf, prolific flowers. That's what you see on the, on the right there. Last year was my first good year for those. And all the bees and butterflies went to those flowers. And then we're getting down to the end here. We've got a couple of yellow flowers to show you, three different ones. The Maximilian sunflower, really tall, robust wildflower of the fall. You'll see them along roadside ditches. Again, very, very popular uh, for pollinators and it adds some big robustness, although it does spread. So that's one you'd have to control. It spreads by underground uh, roots. So keep that in mind. And then we have um, prairie goldenrod. There are lots of different kinds of goldenrods. This one is a lower growing goldenrod in rocky soils. I have it in my yard, which is all loam soil and it does really well. It, self, it, it doesn't self seed so much, but it's easy to grow from seed. Again, goldenrods are magnets for pollinators in the, in the late summer and fall. And then two of my all time favorites uh, that I use uh, all the time and always one in my garden is cowpen daisy. It's a summer, Late spring, summer, fall wildflower. It flowers continuously. It's always flowering once it starts. 
can get up to six feet tall. It isn't annual, but it self seeds every year. And all of the butterflies and moths and in the fall, it becomes one of the most important foods for migrating monarch butterflies. And its cousin is the other one that I really love, which is frostweed. And frostweed has got white flowers. It's a perennial, not an annual. And once it's established, it stays established and it produces all these white flower heads that attract a lot of activity as well. And the reason, of course, it's called frostweed is in the fall, it still has water at the base of its stems. You get a below freezing night. The water inside the stem super freezes, explodes the stem, and you get these beautiful ice crystals. Uh, quite, quite uh, lovely looking. So some issues facing pollinators, habitat fragmentation, we already talked about that. Biological invasions, these are disease and pathogens from native or from non-native competing species, including honeybees, including some of the bee varieties that are used to in greenhouses. Uh, agricultural practices can have negative impacts, pollution and climate change and overuse um, I don't know what, abuse, abuse is what I meant to say, of lawn chemicals and similar. So how do we help these pollinators? Survey your yard or acreage for existing wildflowers and pollinator habitat, see what there is there, do an inventory, protect that existing habitat if you can. Develop an, uh, and I, I guess the way I describe it ultimately is to describe, to develop an intimate relationship with your property uh, and its guests. Um, those, remember the things that we call weeds oftentimes are really important to the pollinators. I pointed it out with a few species. Learn what butterflies and other pollinators are in your yard and area already. Again, iNaturalist can help with that. Provide new habitat. So it doesn't have to be huge. You don't have to create acres worth of habitat. A small garden of native plants um, can work really, really well. Some other considerations, look at plants that not only produce nectar, but also serve as host plants for butterflies. There's a couple of great books uh, that have been recently published on uh, host plants for moths and one for butterflies for our native, with native plants. Really, really important, focus on diversity of both species of wildflowers and, and when they flower. You want to start off with flowers blooming first thing in the spring and at the very cold, when the very coldest days hit, you still want to have things blooming. So look at that. And that's why I do a lot of time. I spend a lot of time out in the natural world looking at what's going on in the natural world and then try to imitate that or reflect that in my uh, small yard. Um, composites, again, the sunflowers are great choices. Gather seeds or purchase plants from local sources. Stay away from plants that are treated with neonics, which are very toxic um, systemic chem uh, uh, pesticides that kill the plant because the pesticide gets in the nectar, it gets in the pollen, it of course gets in the leaves and the stems. And then also when you're buying seed packets from the, the, a box store, if it has California poppy in it, unless you really like California poppy, that is, I don't care if it says native seeds, if it has California poppy in it, it's probably got several species of non-native seeds that potentially could become invasive. A couple other considerations, if in the fall, leave some of your plant stems standing. Bees, a lot of times will burrow into those and, and overwinter there. Uh, leave areas of bare ground. You don't have to have the ground completely covered with flowers or plants. Um, a lot of ground nesting bees, remember I said, the majority of them are the ground nesting bees, they might set up residence there. Um, support other initiatives around your community to create pollinator habitat, and then educate yourself, educate others. Again, stay away from pesticides. And I always like to say diversity begets diversity. And then when by doing something to help pollinators, not only helps you, your community, and it helps the pollinators. Here are a couple of really good resources you can find on Texas Parks and Wildlife's uh, web page. This is being recorded, so you'll be able to pull this later. Uh, this management recommendations for native insect pollinators in Texas is really undersold, underlooked. You don't have to buy it. You can download it from our web page. Really, really good resource for pollinators in the state of Texas. And I just want to briefly mention iNaturalist, of course. Uh, I encourage you to download that. We have 12 projects, including our Bees of Wasps of Texas project. When you take a picture on iNaturalist, you can join this project. 
submit your observation to this project. It gives us more information on our pollinators here in Texas. And we also, just to mention, we do have an Instagram page. Right now, it's not getting a lot of activity because I'm not much of an Instagram person, but our new staff person, I'm thrilled, is uh, Wendy Anderson is going to be joining us, and I'm hoping she'll take that on because she'll be really good at it, I'm thinking. Um, and then we also have a Texas Nature Trackers Facebook page. We do a periodic live Facebook events and also produce a lot of uh, content that is educational and informative for you. I want to give a quick plug to the City Nature Challenge, which, uh, of course, Austin is part of that. And you all are living in that area for Austin. It's going to be fe Friday, February 28th through uh, Monday, May 1st, with identifications of the things that are seen and posted from the Tuesday, May 2nd to Sunday, May 7th. So get out there, download the app, get out there, take pictures, have fun, and uh, help us learn more about the flora and the fauna of the state of Texas. And that is it. There's my email if you want to reach out to me for any reason, help you where I can. And I will stop sharing at this point. All right, thanks so much, Craig. That was a great, great presentation. Um, we have a little bit of time for a question and answer. Um, I'm going to put some links in the chat for everyone, some resources, um, a link to our Balcones Canyon Lands Preserve story map, uh, an events calendar, an interactive map. And um, I also put the link in there for that um, management recommendations for native insect pollinators in Texas uh, PDF that you mentioned. So let's put those in the chat for everybody. Thank, and, thank you for doing that. Of course, yeah. And then I'll hand it over to Jeremy for a QA. and a Awesome. <clears throat> we have several questions here in the chat. If any folks have any others, they can start populating that Q&A box and we'll get to as many of them as we can as uh, time allows here. But um, the first one uh, you covered pretty well in your in your presentation, but I'm going to go ahead and re-ask it and kind of answer it myself here. They asked if wasps are still considered pollinators. The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, he yes. showed a bunch of species of wasp, um, and they're they're great open off open op, overlooked pollinators. So. Yes. Yeah. In fact, I I don't think I had respect for those until I started taking pictures of them and started learning about the diversity that I have in my in my gardens at, at my house, and then I started real doing more reading. And they actually are really, really valuable. So even though you don't want to get stung by them. When you were talking about the different types of pollinators, you did mention that reptiles are pollinators. Do you know some in our area that might be kind of considered? I, I, they, they generally consider them to be out in uh, oceanic islands where there's probably more limited pollination going on. I would think, though, I've seen green anoles, you know, running around in the yard looking for butterflies or bees or whatever. So there might be some accidental, but I don't think I'd call any of them, you know, anywhere near significant. It's more accidental, I'm sure. Kind of like with birds that are flying around flowers looking for things to eat. Right. Other, other than hummingbirds. Right. Next one, I'm going to combine two different questions uh, in the interest of time here. But um, so what flowers, you know, maybe a couple of recommendations for hummingbirds specifically. And then I know a lot of our audience lives in, uh, you know, apartment complexes or has very limited yard space. What is maybe a plant that they could put in a pot on their balcony that might be good for pollinators? So um, let's see that that uh, tropical sage I mentioned, really good. But uh, hummingbirds really love it. It's native. Um, and I think you could pot that up. I actually do think you could pot that up and come back each year. And again, it'll start blooming uh, here in the next month and it'll go all the way through the fall. You can always trim back the, the you know, deadhead them and keep them going. Um, in terms of a, if you had a vine, you know, that you could grow a vine up a trellis or along a rail or something. Um, the, um, uh, I didn't put it in this particular presentation, but um, uh, coral honeysuckle, uh, which is a native honeysuckle. It's got brilliant red flowers. Hummingbirds seem to love that as well. And then that uh, the penstemon, any of the penstemons, if you can get a penstemon, um, and you can put those, you can pot those up. Again, those are perennials, and they would look really nice and really would do a nice job of attracting uh, hummingbirds as well. Yeah, and one that you mentioned during your presentation, the mealy blue sage will also do well. Also, yes. One of my favorite plants ever as well, so I, I agree with that one. <laughs> yep. Um, what do you think about the bug hotels? <laughs> so um, they used to sell butterfly houses. I never really thought much of those, and never there was no evidence that they worked very well. 
I have um, built bumblebee boxes and I've actually made boxes for bees with different size holes. So far, I've had no luck at all, but, but uh, uh, those, those where you take tubes like, um, what is that, um, uh, uh, of plant stems, hollow plant stems and tie them together, sometimes that will work. But the bug hotels, eh, I'd, I'd just provide the right things out, out uh, in your yard and they'll, you'll have all the hotels you need without having to pay a whole lot of money for something that may not work. That's a good way to answer that question. I like it. Um, so the next one here, let me go through. We got several. Um, do the neonicotinoid pesticides carry across generations of plants? This is pretty technical, but can you plant seeds from plants that have been treated? <laughs> so, so I, I don't. I'm not an expert on it, except that the evidence is growing that the neonics are now being more persistent in soil. And um, which is not good uh, for either direct or indirect um, picking up that up. Um, and um, in terms of the seeds, I can't answer that question one way or the other. Uh, my rule of thumb is um, just to stay away from it altogether. They've banned those a lot of those chemicals in Europe. Um, they have failed to do so in the United States and. Um, I think, I think we may pay for that one of these days. Um, um, but if you buy, a lot of people will buy tropical milkweed, for example, to raise monarchs on. And those, if those have been treated with neonics, it just kills the caterpillar. So you're not doing any good. Um, um, so I, I would do everything you can to avoid those, you know. But, you know, that's, that's an individual decision, of course. Sure. Awesome. Well, we have several others that were still, but we're right up on our hour timeline here. So I'm going to cut it off there. Uh, we had a lot of chatter in the chat and the Q&A box about how much they learned and are liking it. So I think there's a lot of uh, good feedback. So we just want to say thank you for joining us again for the Wild Neighbors. Um, your talk was awesome. And this is going to be a great resource for everyone going forward. Thank you very much. Happy to provide the opportunity. You all take good care. Enjoy the spring. It's bursting all around us. Awesome. Everyone have a great day.